So welcome to day two of our admitted student open house. My name is Hayden Lau. I'm with undergraduate admissions and I will be your moderator this evening. Um, so we're currently in the advising panel C session. We do have three concurrent advising panels happening right now. We just want to ensure you're in the right place. So in this session, we will be hearing from the College of Health Professions and Sciences, the College of Medicine, the College of Nursing and the Knights Major and Exploration Center. So we will be recording all of our sessions this evening. So if you were hoping to catch um, a, an additional session to this one, um, you can always go back to our YouTube channel and watch um, at a later time, um, another panel or all three panels if you'd like. So following this panel, we will have two additional sessions for the evening. At 6.15, we will have our on-campus housing presentation. And at 7.15, we will have our Burnett Honors College and Lead Scholars presentation. So these sessions will be in a different link than from what we're um, in right now, um, but we will provide the link for you at the end of this session. And um, you can also find the link on the open house schedule that you probably uh, navigated with to get here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I will introduce our panelists for tonight and then I will hand it over to them to introduce their colleges. So um, during our presentation, please go ahead and add questions for our panelists in the chat box and we will ask um, all of our panelists those live. So this evening we have Jessica Mays from the College of Health Professions and Sciences. We have Ali Sachme from the College of Medicine, Dr. Lucas Naboa from the College of Nursing and Christopher Craig from Knight's Major Exploration Center. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jessica first. Well, good evening, everybody. As Hayden said, my name is Jessica Mays. I'm one of the academic advisors in the College of Health Professions and Sciences. Our college does house four undergraduate majors to include health sciences, communication sciences and disorders, kinesiology, and our BSW or the Bachelors of Social Work program. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ali Sachmi, and I'm an outreach coordinator with the College of Medicine. We have uh, five majors at the College of Medicine. The most popular one uh, is biomedical sciences, and then we have molecular microbiology, molecular and cellular biology, biotechnology, and finally medical laboratory sciences. Medical laboratory sciences is our only limited access program, meaning that you have to complete certain prerequisites uh, before you get to apply to it, uh, but I'll be providing you all with more information about that. I think I was next, Chris. I, I, I apologize for not memorizing the order, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction, Hayden. Dr. Lucas Nabon, I'm the Director of uh, Academic Advising in our uh, College of Nursing at UCF. Um, nursing at UCF is a limited access program. Uh, we've recently opened up a, a new major within the college, but not necessarily in the college, uh, considered uh, undecided nursing. Uh, for students coming in, um, we do have the nursing pending major for the majority of our students. Uh, who will complete uh, prerequisite courses and then submit an application to one of our limited access nursing programs. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit more about some of the, the um, requirements for our limited access nursing program. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Craig. I'm with the NYCHA Exploration and Transition Center. Um, we are a department that works with students who are undeclared at orientation, meaning they have uh, no major decided, we also work with exploratory students. So if you have a student who um, has indicated that they want to follow a major and then changes their mind, we will work with them, um, as well with students who may be redirected out of their uh, current major and need to find a new major. So um, really working with anybody who is interested in looking for a major. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for introducing your different colleges or your area. Um, so again, for everyone viewing, um, please use um, the chat function to ask questions of our panelists. Any questions that you have, they are here to answer them. So we'll go ahead and get started. The first question is for you, Jessica. Um, so what can I do as far as careers with a health sciences degree? Sure thing. So most of our students that are going into a health sciences track um, are particularly doing so because they want to um, go on to some type of professional program. So for our students that do choose the preclinical track, um, that is usually a foundational track for students going into med school, physician assistant, um, dentistry, things along those lines. Um, if a student does choose the health promotions track, which is more our generalist track, um, it's not to say that that track can't lead to those options, um, but definitely those students might be looking to more so pursue something maybe in public health or a graduate program of some sort. Uh, really, the only thing that differentiates the two tracks is their source of electives. 
So students, regardless of track, will still be taking the same exact prerequisites, the same exact core. Um, and then those electives that are specific to the tracks is more so based on the prerequisites that they would want to um, be completing before applying to their post-graduation plans. Um, so again, preclinical track is more so based towards the med school, the PAs, the dentistry, health promotions track is more so the um, you know, graduate program side or something more generalized in healthcare. Thank you. So we did receive a question. Does UCF offer a respiratory care major such as a respiratory therapist um, or is there a track for these students? Um, for me to answer, not specifically to that, but again, you know, there are multiple degree programs that you could look into, especially in some of the programs that are here tonight, um, that you could, you know, get that foundational undergraduate degree and then start to work your way towards what those programs require for prerequisites that may not be included in the program. Um, but I'll obviously allow my colleagues to maybe provide more input if they have any on that as well. All right. No other thoughts on that? Okay, no problem. Um, so next question I believe will be for you, Ollie. So which of the um, College of Medicine majors would be best for my student? Well, glad you asked, Hayden. So um, this is actually a very common question that we get from our students. Uh, what major should I do? You know, depending on where you want to go in terms of your career, that can differ. Um, as I mentioned before, our most popular major is biomedical sciences. And this is what we usually recommend for our students who are looking at going into any health professional program. Okay, so if you want to go to medical school, dental, optometry, podiatry, it doesn't matter. If you're going to a health professional school, we usually recommend that. Um, because the biomedical sciences major actually has all of the prerequisite coursework for these health professional schools built into the curriculum. Um, now, that being said, you are not required to have a biomedical sciences major in order to get into uh, medical school, for example. You can be any major and get into medical school. Um, you can, you know, have like an English degree and even go to medical school. Again, as long as you're completing the required uh, coursework, you'll be okay. And of course, there's the MCAT and GPA and thousand other factors. But uh, in terms of coursework, you don't have to have a specific major. Um, that's why that I recommend that you do your research on each of the majors, see what you like. I'm putting a link into the chat over here right now. Um, this will take you to the biomedical sciences uh, advising page and you can find course catalogs for all five of our majors. Just go through them and you know, see what you like. If you like molecular microbiology a lot, but you still want to go to med school, that's perfectly fine. You can do that. Um, and you know, you're not restricted to just College of Medicine majors. Um, besides biomedical sciences, I would say that um, health sciences is also a very popular major. Both are very popular options for all of our health professional students. So uh, again, just make sure that you're doing your research uh, go through the catalogs, see what you enjoy more, um, and then, you know, make that decision. Thank you, Ali. So next question um, from Morgan. If I put a specific major on my application but want to change it to undecided, what would that mean for my courses, and what steps uh, would I have to take to do that? Um, Chris, I don't know if you have any, any um, suggestions on also how the next major center can help with this. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so similarly, I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat as well. Um, and this is just an instructional uh, guide on how to change your major through your MyUCF Student Center. Um, so you are able to go ahead and change your major to undeclared. Um, once you're admitted, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and then when you are going through the orientation process, you should have the option of following um, the Knights Major Exploration and Transition Center. Um, and so we will work with you at orientation. We'll look at all of the credits that you're incoming with. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit about where your interests maybe lie, uh, and we can do some general schedule planning um, at orientation based off of that. Um, additionally, throughout the summer and into the fall, um, we also have a major exploration program that we do through our office, which gives you a little bit more time to kind of sit down one-on-one -on -one with advisors. Um, we have peer coaches, and we can kind of work through my plan assessment, um, uh, what can I do with this major? Um, 
several different kind of activities that we can kind of walk you through to kind of help you establish what major you're interested in. Um, I will say that sometimes um, if you are, are currently declared in a major and you know what major you want to go to, working with the college of that new major is helpful. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you, if you know what major you want to go to, um, following that college for orientation is more helpful. But if you're completely undecided um, or if you're, if you're tossing around a couple of different ideas and different colleges, um, you can definitely work with our center and we can help you kind of distinguish those areas and figure out what works best for you. Thank you, Chris. So next question, I think coming to you, Dr. Naboa. So to become a nurse, do you have to major in BSN or can you major in something else such as neuroscience? Uh, so the, the um, exam to become a registered nurse is known as the INCLEX. Uh, in order to take the INCLEX, a student must graduate with either an ASN or, or a BSN, either the Associate of Science in Nursing or the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Um, that's the exam to become a registered nurse. So you cannot necessarily major in anything else and, and then qualify to take the INCLEX exam. Um, what our curriculum is doing is preparing students to pass the board's exam to become a registered nurse. So. If your goal is to become a, a, an RN, a registered nurse, uh, you would have to go through either the BSN curriculum um, or, or an ASN curriculum. Um, here at UCF, we don't offer the ASN. Um, we have a lot of students who get the, the BSN um, and then go on to specialize um, through graduate programs. I know a couple of my colleagues here have mentioned about graduate programs. Um, we do have different, whether it's the DNP, the Doctor of Nurse Practice, or, or the MSN, the Nurse Practice, um, nurse practitioner programs, um, even through the PhD in nursing. So um, students begin to get more specialized the more education they receive. Um, the BSN is very broad, it's very general because it's preparing students to pass the INCLEX exam, uh, which is a very broad and general exam to become a registered nurse. Thank you for that. So next question, can you provide thoughts on the communication sciences disorders, BA or BS, and which one do you think is best, the BA or the BS? Yes. Um, so yes, with that question, essentially the BA versus the BS, there's not one that's better than the other. Really what distinguishes the two is that you would go for the Bachelor of Science or the BS degree if you want to use the two years of foreign language from high school. Um, you're electing to do the BA or the Bachelor of Arts option if you plan to take two years of foreign language at the college level. That's really all that differentiates the two. So again, not one track is better than the other. It's just a matter of how you're going to uh, earn your foreign language credit, either using the two years from high school for the BS or the two years of foreign language in college for the BA. Thank you, Jessica. Next question I think is for you, Ollie. If you want to become a PA or a PT, how can students choose between the health sciences versus biomed or what other considerations can be made for that? Okay, so um, that's a, a kind of difficult one for me to answer. Um, again, I would say um, refer back to the course catalogs for both of the majors that you're in between. Uh, this doesn't go just for uh, physical therapy or physician assistant programs. It goes to any health professional programs. Um, look at the, the catalogs and, you know, see, would you rather be learning like more about, I don't know, like health policy, epidemiology? Um, are you like, okay doing like molecular biology and stuff like that? You know, what uh, courses are you, you know, more comfortable with taking basically? Um, along with that, I would say if there is a specific program that you're looking at applying to, make sure that you check out their prerequisites. You can usually find this information online. Um, they would tell you that you need to have, I don't know, like a physiology or genetics, molecular biology, whatever courses they may be. Um, and, you know, see which degrees may be more aligned um, with the path you're looking to take. Um, I don't want you to be too worried that like, if you go with biomedical sciences and later on you decide that health sciences was right, that's not a big deal at all because these two majors are so similar, especially uh, in the first few years that you'll be totally fine changing, um, you know, between one and the other. Um, and if uh, Jessica would like to add anything on to that. Um, yeah, so again, um, no specific major required, um, you know, for entrance into a medical school or anything like that. Um, I think as, as Ali was saying, 
Um, our colleges see a lot of going back and forth between our majors. Um, and for us, really with health sciences and biomed, those are probably going to be the two majors that students do switch in between. Um, but again, not one is better than the other. Um, my thing that I usually tell students is take a look at the course catalog, compare the curriculums, see which classes you may find to be a little bit more interesting. Um, and sometimes that can help students make some choices to differentiate between which one might be the, the better route for them. Thank you, Jessica and Ollie for that answer. Um, Dr. Naboa, I think this next one is for you. So with nursing undecided at the advising session, will a track be recommended with specific classes to take to apply for the UCF nursing program? Yeah, so undecided nursing is actually going to be over with Chris, and, and we're going to have students meet with KMETC. Um, this is a major that we've just introduced for our incoming students, um, for those who are starting in summer and fall. Um, some students will be selected to, to join the undecided nursing major. Uh, we're going to ask that students remain in that major uh, for at least one semester. Um, after their first fall semester, if they're able to obtain a 3.0, they can then change their major into nursing pending. Um, this just gives, um, st gives students an opportunity to work with uh, Chris's um, department, KMETC, in terms of major exploration. They'll be offered a, a number of different resources that the College of Nursing won't be able to offer just due to numbers. Um, once a student has a 3.0, which is the, the minimum application requirement for students to actually apply to the College of Nursing, um, students can then switch their major to nursing pending. Um, the students who are undecided nursing will be advised just like a nursing pending student. Um, KMETC, their office over there has an understanding of the requirements for the nursing pending major, and they will advise the students as such. The only difference is that these students are just given the additional support, uh, more one-on-one -on -one attention when meeting with the KMET C advisor uh, in comparison to uh, the College of Nursing where nursing pending is housed. But other than that, and students can change their major to nursing pending and, and like Ali in the College of Medicine, you don't even need to be a College of Nursing or nursing pending student to apply to our limited access program. We're essentially making sure that you've met the prerequisite and application requirements um, to apply to our major and change your major to nursing. So at the end of the day, um, some students will be undecided nursing, some students will be nursing pending, um, but when it comes to application time and submitting that application, you can really be any major as long as you've met the required courses and you've met uh, the minimum requirements for the application. All right, so our next question is about double majoring. So I have my major set as biomedical sciences and intend to study medicine. However, I was also planning on getting a degree in psychology. Um, so do you know about the process for double majoring or who to contact for this? I'll kind of open that up to all of our panelists. I can, I can, it's, I can share it. And Chris, you can add as well. Um, it's not something that's very common with nursing just because of the rigor uh, of the nursing curriculum, but, but students do double major quite frequently. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of majors that may share similar courses. Um, there's a lot of majors and minors that may, may share some similar courses. Um, so you can actually declare a second major um, and start working on that simultaneously. Uh, you won't be able to graduate um, with the unless both majors are met. So you need to keep that in mind. You can't graduate with one major um, with requirements for the other major unsatisfied. So at that time, you would have to drop the other major, graduate with the first major, and then actually come back and be readmitted to complete the second major. And Chris probably has more to add. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say, so, so when you're double majoring, essentially what will happen is that uh, if, if the programs are not in the same college, you will individually work with both colleges to kind of schedule plan for your degree. Um, for orientation purposes, I, you, you will only be able to choose one. So go with the major that you are planning to kind of primarily follow. And then after orientation, you will set up additional meetings with um, the other college that you are planning to pursue. Um, so in that example, if you follow biomed for orientation, then you would set up an appointment with the College of Sciences to discuss um, psychology. Um, and so that would kind of be your process for advising. You may get a biomed schedule up front, but at orientation, make sure to let your, know, let your advisors know that you are planning to double major um, and we can all do our best to assist you um, with the best schedule to kind of work towards both. As Lucas was saying, there may be some overlap um, that you can start working on early enough until you're able to make an appointment with both advising offices. 
Thank you both. So um, Chris, this next question is for you as well. So um, how do, what do I do if I'm not really sure what I want to major in at UCF? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the first thing that is super important and can be helpful before you come to orientation is to take a look at the catalog, um, which I know is earlier in the chat is linked to the catalog, which will show you all of our programs of study. Um, one of the things that I think is most helpful is just kind of copying that list into a Word document and deleting out everything that you know you don't want, um, because sometimes it can be easier to eliminate the things that you know you're not planning to, to kind of focus on, which will leave you with a list of um, areas that you're potentially interested in studying. Um, so, so that can be a really great first step is just to know what we are offering at UCF and make sure that, um, you know, we, we can provide you with a program. Um, you can bring that list to orientation. Um, and then from there, uh, there's a bunch of career services resources. They have my plan assessments that you can take. Um, there are, um, uh, what can I do with this major is a great website where you can kind of look at each major. It will link you to different uh, career areas and, and that kind of links out to a bunch of other different websites. Um, so there's a lot of independent research that you can do. And then once you come to orientation, like I said, we have a whole major exploration program that will walk you through those steps together and, and we can kind of work through that um, to make a plan for what you do want to major in. It can be kind of daunting, but, but we figure it out, so. Thank you, Chris. Um, so next question, Jessica, maybe Ollie, um, if this one might be for you. So what percentage of pre-med students get into med school? And if we don't have that specific number available, what resources are available for students who are applying for med school at UCF? Oh, I actually just looked this up. Um, the information for this past application cycle is not yet available because the application cycle is not yet over, um, but for the cycle ending in 2020, there were 51,996 applicants and 21,519 matriculants, which means that 41.3% uh, of applicants got into medical school. Um, I, I know it's not like the best odds, it's not like an 80% acceptance or you know something great like that. Um, it's it's tough i'll say um that's why I, I feel like it's more important to um kind of take things one step at a time don't like rush yourself um what a lot of students do that ends up kind of hurting their medical school applications is they save all their i don't know volunteering or research or mcat studying all for that very end they try to cram it all in during their senior year and that ends up hurting things, you know, because if it's your senior year um, and you're trying to somehow get 600 volunteering hours while publishing posters and stuff and studying for the MCAT, um, you might not do that great. So I think as long as you're getting started early with these things, um, you would be on the right track. We have lots of helpful resources available at UCF. Um, I think one of the greatest resources that I personally used a lot was the uh, pre-health and pre-law advising office. They have dedicated advisors that you can meet with. Um, I usually recommend once a semester or once every other semester. Um, and you can look at your medical school application, basically um, how competitive are you? Do you need to have more research? Should you do some more clinical or non-clinical volunteering? When should you take the MCAT? all that kind of information. Um, so again, we do have lots of resources available. I don't you know, want anyone to be too worried right now about whether or not you're gonna get into med school. Um, you, you, know, you can definitely do something about that early on. Um, and if Jessica wants to add on anything. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would I would definitely echo um, everything that Ali said. Um, and again, just to kind of piggyback a little bit more on those pre health and pre law um, office, um, they are an excellent resource for any of the health sciences, um, you know, or College of Medicine majors to go to. Um, they do workshops um, right now virtually um, that have really helped students be able to prepare their letters of recommendation, know more about the application process, uh, the do's and don'ts. Um, and so again, definitely, um, as was mentioned, use them as a resource if your end goal is to try to apply to PA schools or medical schools or anything like that. Um, they're really going to be a wonderful resource for you um, for that preparation, um, which is going to make a big impact on how your application is looked at. 
Um, they do mock interviews, um, which is an excellent resource because what it does then for you is if you get one of those interviews, you can practice with the UCF staff um, and see how things go and, and reflect on how well it went. That way that you can really be prepared for where maybe you didn't do so well in your mock interview for your real interview where it's gonna count. So uh, again, yes, pre auth and pre-law is an excellent resource for anybody wishing to apply to some type of professional program uh, later on. All right, thank you both. Um, Jessica, I know you kind of were just touching on this, um, but I'll bring it back to you again. If you could talk a, a little bit more in detail about our pre-professional tracks. Um, I know someone did ask specifically about a PA track. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could just touch a bit more on those. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I believe the question was uh, referencing if the preclinical track would be a right path um, for a, a PA student. Um, and yes, um, preclinical track is typically the one that students will choose if they're going on to medical school, PA school, dentistry, some other of those medical fields. And, and that really is because that track has the electives um, that encompass most of the prerequisites that you're going to need for those schools. Um, students that are uh, traditionally getting the health promotions track are doing so because, again, as I mentioned earlier, they're looking at more generalized public health, um, you know, maybe going on to graduate programs. That is also the track that most of our um, physical therapy or occupational therapy students may choose. I know there was a question in there earlier about that. Um, so, you know, the more generalist track would be for a PT or an OT student because the um, electives that are part of that list are not going to be as rigorous because those programs don't require the rigor of those. So a prime example would be that most um, PT schools are not going to require a student to have organic chemistry too. Maybe the student chooses to take it because they're not quite sure where they're going yet. Um, but again, it's not I, you know, likely that you're going to need that um, as, a PT, as a PT student. So to put yourself through preclinical track with more rigorous science electives than what you're going to actually need for your professional programs, students will opt for the other track that has the more relatable um, electives. Um, same thing, there was a question in there, um, if I may, Hayden, about if you are thinking PT or OT, go kinesiology or health sciences. You know, just to go ahead and address that, either major um, is sufficient. Again, both will, will create a wonderful foundation for you to apply to a program such as that. Um, again, it goes back to reviewing the curriculum for both of those programs um, and definitely finding out which one might tailor more so to what, to what you're looking for. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate mm -hmm. the answer. Yeah, no problem. All right, um, Dr. Navoa, next question is for you. So what are you all looking for when it comes to nursing applications? Do you need letters of recommendation? Do you need um, service hours, shadowing? Can you uh, speak a little bit on that? Yeah, that? That's a great question. And it varies between nursing programs. Uh, at UCF, we're, we're looking purely at quantitative data. Uh, we're looking at GPAs and we're looking at a standardized test that we require known as the T's exam. So we're looking at cumulative GPA considering all undergraduate coursework. So that could include dual enrollment courses and all the courses leading up to the application. Uh, we also have eight nursing prerequisite courses and we break that GPA into two different categories. We have a science category and a non-science category. So our four science courses are human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology, and a fourth science course. So it could be a chemistry or biology. So we look at the GPA there we have four non-science courses, developmental psychology, general psychology, human nutrition, and statistics. So we look at the GPA there. So those three, three GPAs and then the test of essential academic skills, the TEAS, the TEAS exam, we look at that score and then we essentially rank our applicants. Um, for our fall 2021 cohort, so that application just closed in February, uh, we had 696 applicants. Um, we seat 126. Um, in our program. So that kind of gives you an idea of um, acceptance rates and the competitiveness of our program. Uh, we always have to remind students that just meeting the minimum application requirements does not guarantee you admission. Um, students are, are achieving well beyond the averages um, in order to get into our programs just based on the number of students who are coming into the, 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 the institution who want to be nursing and then the limited amount of seats that we have. So we look purely at the quantitative data. We do not take um, letters of recommendation, uh, volunteer hours. Those are all great things to have. And I wouldn't, I would highly encourage that you do them. It's just not something that we consider on our nursing application at this time. Thank you, Dr. Novoa. Next question is for you again, Jessica. Um, so for communication sciences and disorders, thoughts on the fast track for masters or would it be best to finish the BA or BS as normal and then do a masters? Any advice on this at all? 
So it's really going to be more of a personal preference. Um, I will go ahead um, and pop in an email address um, for the CSD Undergraduate Advising Office. Um, they could probably go ahead and send you some pamphlets on that accelerated track. Um, I will tell you from just our experience, there's not a whole lot of students that end up doing that. And I think it all, it all that in part depends on when students find out about it. Um, because if you are going to do the fast track, you do have to do it at a specific time in your program because you can't surpass a certain number of credits or have taken certain classes to be able to do that accelerated. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, like I said, and I'll put that email address in there and you can contact them directly um, for that information so that you have an idea of, you know, if you are in the CSD undergraduate major, kind of where you have to make that decision once you get to a certain point in your curriculum as to whether or not you're gonna continue on to just finish the BS degree or whether you might, like I said, um, wanna transition into that fast track. Thank you, Jessica. All right, our next question I think is for you, Ollie. I got selected into biomedical sciences in the honors program. Does this have the same curriculum as the biomedical sciences under the Burnett Medical Scholars Program? I will just preface and say we do have an honors um, presentation at 7.15 p.m. this evening. Uh, if you're not able to answer, um, we would definitely direct you to that session. Either way, we'll direct you to that session. But um, Ollie, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, so I definitely do recommend attending that honor session. It's going to be very helpful, especially if you're uh, part of the Burnett Medical Scholars Program. Um, I do just want to clarify one thing. It's, it's uh, kind of confusing for a lot of our students, actually. Um, the Burnett Honors College and the Burnett School of Biomedical Sciences are two uh, totally different things. They are just named Burnett because of the, the donors, Al and Nancy Burnett. They just happen to you know donate to both colleges. Um, but, so I'm just looking for the question again to, yeah, so the curriculum, if you're part of a Burnett Medical Scholars, um, you do not need to have a specific major to my knowledge. There are certain classes that you're required to do. Um, I'm sending the link for this into the chat right now. Um, and you can just, you know, go to the coursework section to see exactly what classes you need. Um, but if anyone is looking for more information on the Burnett Medical Scholars Program, it's a uh, program that once you are admitted to um, upon your entry at UCF, you have to complete certain requirements, not just coursework, but you need to have a certain MCAT score, certain number of uh, shadowing and volunteering hours. Uh, you have to complete an undergraduate thesis. Um, once you complete all of these by the end of your fourth year, you are guaranteed admission to the UCF College of Medicine. Um, so it's a great program. I definitely recommend that you uh, check it out. And again, make sure that you do attend that honors presentation right after. Thank you, Ali. Next question is for you as well. Um, so what jobs can you get with a biomedical science degree? Yeah, so this is um, another one that we get a lot. Um, so our students don't only go down the health professional school route. Um, there's other ways that you can go as well. Um, I'm finding the link right now, trying to send it to you. Sorry, one second. All right, I just sent a link into the chat uh, for careers in biomedical sciences. So again, you're not just limited to uh, health professional schools. Um, after you get your bachelor's degree, you can go into any of these careers. Um, a lot of them are like laboratory technician positions, stuff like that. Um, I will say that the vast majority of the positions you'll be looking for with the biomedical sciences degree will require some form of certification. Um, so um, you're not very likely to be able to find employment with just the bachelor's degree alone. You may have to you know, take some sort of a certification exam um, in order to actually be qualified to work in whatever setting it may be. Um, and, you know, after biomedical sciences, if, you know, you're not looking at going down that route, you can also go to graduate schools. So we have lots of students who um, go on and get their master's degree or their PhD. Um, so, you know, if you want to go down the research route, if biotechnology interests you, um, you definitely have those options available as well. And I just want to say really quick with the medical laboratory sciences program, which was our one limited access program. Uh, that's what we always recommend for students who want to become medical laboratory technicians. 
we have a 100% job placement rate, meaning every single student who gets into this program uh, graduates at the end of their four years with a job lined up for them, which is great. I mean, who doesn't like job security? Um, but that is a very hands-on career. So if you really, really love lab work, I recommend that you look into that one. Thank you, Ali. So our next question, um, if I took dual enrollment at SPC, how do those credits transfer over or does it depend? So I'll take that question. Um, so those credits from, or Chris, if you wanna take it, feel free, I saw you unmuted. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I can, I can answer that. Um, so dual enrollment um, is at a Florida institution, uh, we have common course code numbering. So a lot of times those courses um, come over and it's not too difficult. Um, it will vary major by major. So we'll first look to see how they apply to your general education courses. Um, but if you are trying to use any of those dual enrollment courses towards your major, um, that may uh, just require you to work with your major advisor, your college advising office to get those verified. Um, I will say, if you haven't already, um, make sure that you're sending those transcripts from the institution that you dual enrolled at, so they won't come over on your high school transcripts. You have to have them sent from SPC in this example. Um, and at orientation, it is definitely helpful if you can have unofficial uh, transcripts showing those dual enrollment credits so that when you are working with your advisors, if there are any questions, you have those kind of available to show. Um, so overall, SPC credits should be a, a pretty easy uh, transfer over, but it'll just kind of be working with your college advisor to make sure that they meet the areas that you're looking to, for them to meet. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, next question, I think, Chris, for you, maybe Dr. Navoa. Um, I'm current. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm currently going to be enrolled as undecided. How would I go into nursing as my major in terms of requirements? I can I can take that, Hayden. Um, okay. So right now, we're at, we've actually turned off uh, the ability for um, FTIC students who come in as another major to swap into. Uh, nursing pending. Um, you can, however, add the undecided nursing uh, major and, and begin working with KMETC. And that same thing is going to apply. If after your first fall semester, you have over 3.0, you can then change into nursing pending. Um, the the KMETC advisors are familiar with the nursing requirements, so they can very well guide you into course registration and the requirements for a nursing major. Um, but it would be a switch from undecided to undecided nursing. So you would essentially be working with KMETC to go back to KMETC, who would um, definitely provide you. But all you had to do is say, hey, I'm interested in going into nursing. And they would provide you with the schedule for, for summer, fall um, with, with nursing um, down the line at, in that mindset. Thank you, Dr. Naboa. Uh, next question um, is coming to you, Jessica. Is kinesiology the best major if hoping to get into an AT program? Kinesiology would definitely be an appropriate undergraduate major. I think, again, this doubles back to kind of what we've been talking about this evening is that there's not really any one specific undergraduate program required to go into these graduate level programs. Um, professional school programs, but again, you want to do something that's relatable simply because you want to have those prerequisites ready to go. It's going to make, you know, your transition a lot easier um, applying to those programs if a lot of those prerequisites are already completed. Um, so in a short answer, yes, kinesiology would be an appropriate undergraduate major um, to then apply for a master's in athletic training, um, and that is a program that UCF does offer. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. So next question, I believe it's for you, Ali. I want to do research with diseases as a career, and I'm planning on majoring in biomedical sciences, molecular slash cellular biology. I'm considering going to med school, but I'm not sure yet. Would doing pre-med as opposed to biomed be better for research? Okay, so, um, so pre-med, uh, is you know that's not like its own specific major it's just kind of the route that you're going down so you can be pre-med any major um if you are looking at going into medical school um but you enjoy molecular and cellular biology then you know that's totally fine you can you can keep that major um the your other option is, you know, you can just do a biomedical sciences major without, you know, selecting any of these specific tracks. Um, and when you are selecting your five restricted electives, you can see where the restricted electives are in the course catalog. 
Um, but you can, you can select them to be more kind of geared towards the molecular and cellular biology. Um, so if you kind of want that flexibility, um, if you feel like you might enjoy molecular and cellular biology, but you also kind of like infectious disease a little, and you sort of like neuroscience, but you also like genetics, then I recommend that you um, go with the biomedical sciences major. Um, and then, you know, you can Again, we're flexible with your restricted electives, whatever you would like to do for those ones. Um, as long as it's on that list of courses, you can do that. Thank you, Ali. So um, the next question I will ask of each of you. Um, so are there any organizations or clubs or different ways students can get involved within your college or your area? Um, and if you could just talk a little bit more about those. I'll start. Okay. Um, we uh, uh, we uh, don't have any clubs that are kind of linked to being undeclared, but if you are undeclared, that's one of the great ways to explore your options um, without paying for intro courses or anything like that. So any way that you can kind of get involved with clubs that maybe are associated with your areas of interest, that's a really great way to explore and start networking. Um, if you are undeclared, like I said, we do have uh, the major exploration program that um, is as long as you need it to be to help you kind of declare your major. Um, we have peer coaches who are current undergraduate students that have also been undeclared and gone through this process who are able to kind of walk you through and um, give you tips on what they found helpful through exploration and kind of help you start that conversation. Um, our office does hold every semester a majors fair where we collaborate with all of the colleges um, so that you are able to kind of pop into each of those college areas and ask questions based on the majors that you may be interested in. Um, so a lot of ways that you can get involved uh, in our office um, and we have that link on our website for events. Um, you're always welcome to, to kind of get started with us if you are undeclared, but I did want to just reiterate again, getting involved in anything that's associated with something you're interested in is a great way to explore. I can, I can speak about nursing. So uh, in the College of Nursing, we actually offer a, a, an introductory exploratory course. Um, it's uh, actually called NSP 1800 Nursing as a Profession. Um, it's, the, it's actually taught by a nursing faculty member. You don't necessarily have to be a nursing student. It's open enrollment. Um, but it gives the students the ability to work with a nursing faculty member and kind of understand the nuances of nursing and everything that's incorporated in the profession. And we also have an association of pre-nursing students. It's uh, APNS at, at UCF. It's actually um, through the Office of Student Involvement. Um, it's a great opportunity to meet other pre-nursing students who are working towards that same goal. Um, they do meetings. They have guest speakers. They've had a couple of registered nurses come in and speak to students. Um, I've gone and, and spoken to students. They've had faculty members go and introduce students, but it's just a good organization to, to be involved in. They do volunteer hours. They, they're involved in the community. And like I said, they hold monthly meetings. Um, so that's one of the groups in terms of clubs and organizations. Um, but we do have that exploratory course within the College of Nursing if students are. Uh, I don't know if nursing's for me or not. That's a great introductory course. It's a three credit course taught by a faculty member. Um, to kind of introduce you to, to nursing as a profession. And I guess I can go next. Um, so with the four undergraduate majors that the College of Health Professions and Sciences has, we do have a lot of um, organizations um, and internship opportunities uh, that our majors will offer, um, specifically for communication sciences and disorders, uh, the Pre-Professional Association, the National Student Speech, Language, and Hearing Association is pretty popular. Um, this major does not require an internship. Um, however, though, um, that's usually only for the graduate students, but students can seek um, internships with non-CSD departments if they wanted to, um, but again, not required for graduation. Um, health sciences, again, there as well does not have a required internship, um, but the preclinical track does offer that as part of an elective option um, if you wanted to get some field experience, um, but that is definitely something that many of our students will go ahead and do. Um, it just helps out on their applications, um, but again, um, community programs, um, they offer um, shadowing opportunities and research are going to be the main things for health sciences. Um, associations and clubs, again, uh, the pre-medical uh, American, no, pre-med American Medical Student Association um, is a pretty popular one for our students in that. Um, let's see, kinesiology, 
Um, we have had students um, do uh, not necessarily an internship, but they have a practicum, which is required um, for that major um, at places like Orlando Health, Orlando City Soccer, the YMCA, um, UCF's own wellness and research um, center, um, and then associations as well that they have there, the Sport and Exercise Science Club, um, Student Athletic Training Organization, uh, just to name a few. And then for social work, social work is our only limited access program that does require a separate application um, outside of general admission. Um, and with that one, that does have a required um, internship or what they refer to as a field experience in order to graduate. Um, and for them, they do have the BSW Student Association um, as well as honors in the major, just to name a few. All right, so I guess I'll go next. Um, I am sending, uh, another list right now uh, for some kind of like biomed related clubs. Um, we don't have any that we like really recommend our students join. Um, if you are looking at getting your clinical hours, a lot of these ones on here are going to be great for you. Um, for example, um, pre-med AMSA um, or MAPS. Um, those are great for, you know, getting your clinical volunteering hours um, or just any of your volunteering hours. You can do like Habitat for Humanity, whatever, really. Um, so, yeah, you can you can check these out and, you know, you can find kind of like minded students who are going down a similar career path. It would be great for that. Um, but we always recommend that our students kind of just branch out, look at, you know, what really interests you. Um, I I'm sending like probably the 30th link that I've sent into the chat today. Um, if you go onto Night Connect, you can see all of our RSOs. And you know, just looking at this list right now, it says there's 847 that you can select. Um, there is a, an organization or a club for you know, anything that you like, as long as it's not too weird. Um, you, know, you, you would find like, I don't know, if you like cars or photography or cooking, going outdoors, um, you know, just make sure that you explore this definitely. Um, you know, find your group of people, I guess. Thank you all for sharing all the different ways you can get um, plugged in with your major. Um, so next question, um, kind of a two-part question. We have two people asked similar questions. So can you become a doctor with the BSN degree um, or can you become a PA with the BSN degree? And are there any extra classes that would be required um, for that? So I'll open that up to whoever would like to share um, for that. I will share that you will certainly need additional courses uh, for medical programs. Uh, in the College of Nursing, the highest math that you're probably going to take is going to be up to college algebra. Um, you're gonna have the human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology requirement. Um, but you're not necessarily going to have advanced chemistry courses or advanced biology courses um, that most medical programs are going to require. Um, I know Ali mentioned this before, you can apply to med school no matter what your major is. Um, however, that might not be the best option to do the BSN um, and then actually have to go back to take all of the prerequisite courses in order to be eligible to apply to medical programs. So in that situation, you may be better off in looking through a major in CHIPS or in the College of Medicine if your end goal is to become a physician or an MD. Um, now, at the same time, if you're looking to do nursing and practice nursing and, and become a registered nurse and go through that profession and then come back and, and do medicine, um, you would certainly have some of those prerequisites already in nursing. Thank you, Lucas. All right, so next question. Um, I think this one's gonna be for you, Chris. If I would like to have my major be nursing, undecided nursing, is the best way to do that to make a virtual appointment through the KMETC office before orientation? So uh, all of our advising actually takes place starting at orientation. So um, what you would wanna do in the meantime um, is go ahead and, and you can change into the undecided nursing. Um, and then that essentially funnels you to us for um, orientation purposes. So, um, so that's really kind of the process. Um, and, and like Lucas has reiterated, our office is uh, very well trained in the nursing prerequisites. So we are very familiar with the program and the tracking for it. 
it um, and at orientation as long as you are undecided nursing we will we will treat you exactly the same way as any nursing pending student and making sure that you are hitting those markers to um, to kind of work towards the the goal of nursing um, but as far as advising pre-orientation um, it would actually start at orientation Thank you, Chris. All right, so we are nearing the end of our time. I have one last question for you all. Um, and then um, we are going to include the link to our next session here um, so you know where to go for the 615 session. So last question will be on the pending statuses. A lot of our students, or a lot of the, your majors um, will have that pending status. What does that mean for students? How do they drop that pending status? Um, can you just touch a little bit more on that, please? I, I can start, and I know that most of us have pending status majors. Pending is essentially um, you're working towards those requirements. Um, to drop the pending status would mean you are admitted actually into the major. Um, for, for nursing specifically, we have um, far too many qualified students and not enough seats in our program. Um, so therefore, all of our students are in the pending status to begin, and then they submit the additional application to then actually change their major into nursing. Um, the, the pending status just means that you're working towards those majors. So um, as long as you're meeting with an advisor every semester, um, starting at orientation and, and working towards understanding what the requirements are for that pending status and to be eligible to apply to that program, because you're going to want to understand when are the application deadlines for specific programs? Um, some programs are going to require additional tests, um, like nursing, for instance. Um, some programs are going to require minimum GPAs to apply. Um, some are going to require specific courses. Um, so as long as you're meeting with an advisor every semester beginning at orientation, um, you'll be well on your way to, to moving yourself out of the pending status and actually into the major. Um, you're going to want to make sure, obviously, that your GPAs remain high, um, that you're doing well on standardized test scores, that if, if that's what's required, um, because you're also competing, essentially, with like you did when you were applying to UCF. You're applying with uh, many other qualified students, and you want to put forward the best application. So your, your application that you're submitting in two years for, for the actual major um, begins now. Uh, the, the courses that you're taking now the, the hours that you put in studying, the, the, the English or the composition one course you take now, those courses count. Um, it may not be, if you're looking at nursing, it may not be a nursing course. Um, you may not be extremely interested in it, um, but when you go to submit your application, that GPA and that, that, that letter grade that you received in that course is going to influence and affect whether or not you're admitted into the nursing major. And, and the same thing with a lot of these other limited access programs that are looking at GPAs. So I think, um, to answer your question, pending is just working towards those requirements, but you're, you haven't met those requirements quite yet. And I guess I can um, go ahead and talk about the CHIPS majors. So um, for us, the communication sciences and disorders uh, major is the only open access major. So for us, for pending, we have the health sciences preclinical track. So health promotion, I guess, uh, like I said, is still considered an open. Um, you have to have a 2.5 GPA though for that. But for the preclinical track, you would be applying as pending and a way a student gets out of pending is actually by reaching a 3.0 GPA. Um, so it's not necessarily a time frame in your program. Um, it's usually ran at the end of each cycle um, academically um, where they identify students with a 3.0 and then we'll go ahead and move them um, out of that pending status into the health sciences preclinical track. Um, kinesiology, same thing as kinesiology pending when you come in, that is going to require a formal change of major request and students are submitting those once they have gone ahead and completed all of their general education prerequisites, uh, which are done typically during those first two years if you're coming in as a traditional freshman. If you're an accelerated freshman, then like I said, that might be done a little bit sooner. Um, but all the general education prerequisites are done, your Gordon Rule writing and math are done, your foreign language is completed, and you do have that 2.5 GPA. Um, you can go online through your portal and submit the change of major request, um, and you'll elect, like I said, the track um, that you're going into, which is the um, sport and exercise, um, or excuse me, the, um, the one track that is remaining with that program. And then you're going to um, go ahead and do the same thing for the BSW program with social work. Um, because social work is limited access, but you still come in as a BSW pending student. 
Um, and so therefore you're, con you know, you are going ahead and completing all of your general education prerequisites um, or, you know, again, there, you're going ahead and doing your foreign language, your Gordon rule writing, your Gordon rule um, math classes. Um, they do want you to start on your prerequisites. I will say they're a little bit less um, strict than some other restricted majors where not all prerequisites have to be done. Um, they have admitted students conditionally that may have one or two outstanding prerequisites. Um, but again, the goal is to try to go ahead and have those completed at the time of application. Um, and again, that 2.5. Um, and then that's when you'll go ahead and actually apply to the program. Um, so for them, it's, it's, it's an actual application. Kinesiology is a change of major online. And then the health sciences preclinical is more so just a general cycle um, look at students that are meeting that criteria. All right, so um, for all five of the College of Medicine majors, uh, we also have the pending status. Um, in order to get the pending status removed, um, if you are a biomedical sciences, molecular microbiology, molecular cellular biology, or biotechnology student, um, you would need to pass biology one, chemistry one, chemistry two, and organic chemistry one with a C or better. Um, once you pass all those classes, again, with a C or better, uh, you'll have the pending status removed and you are officially admitted into your major. Um, if you are an MLS student, you'll be MLS pending until you've met the admission requirements. Um, and again, you have to go through an actual application process with interviews, get letters of recommendation, all that stuff for the MLS program. Um, I just sent another link. Um, sorry for spamming everyone with all the, the links and text and stuff, but um, you can see the MLS program admission requirements in that link that um, I just sent. Also keep in mind that we do have a um, progress policy for all of our students. Um, Basically, if you get a certain number of withdrawals or a low grade, low grade being like a C minus, D, F, no credit, unsatisfactory withdrawal, um, you can get placed on uh, academic probation. Um, and, you know, if that goes on and you get more of those withdrawals or low grades, then, um, you know, you will be meeting with Chris from KMETC um, to, you know, explore and, you know, find alternative majors. Um, again, you can find more information about all of this on the Burnett School of Biomedical Sciences website. All right. Well, we are at the end of our time for today. So Jessica, Ollie, Chris, Dr. Naboa, thank you all so much for being here, sharing so much good information with our um, incoming nights. Um, so for everyone else, we are going to be switching over to the Zoom webinar. The link is um, in the chat. Um, you can again also find it on the open house schedule. Um, we will beginning, um, be beginning with our housing and residence life information session starting at 615. And then we have our honors and lead presentation at 715. So we will see you over there on the other link. Um, hope you all have a great night and thanks again to our panelists. Bye. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Garcia, how about you go next with the College of Arts and Humanities? Hi there, uh, my name is Delia Garcia and I'm with the College of Arts and Humanities Student Advising Office. Uh, we call that CASA for short, C-A-H-S-A. -S -A. Um, in terms of the College of Arts and Humanities, we have uh, on the humanities side, a number of majors that are open access. So students who select one of our humanities majors um, are admitted directly into the major. Um, on the other side of the house, we have our arts programs, which are divided between the School of Performing Arts, which is music and theater, and the School of Visual Arts and Design, which has a number of majors, most of which are restricted access. So, for the students who are joining us today and plan to pursue music or theater, please be sure to admit to uh, audition as soon as possible. And uh, for the school, for the students who are pursuing a major in SFAD, the School of Visual Arts and Design, uh, most of you will have to go through all of the co common program prerequisites before you're eligible for admission into a restricted major. So you'll have more time to work through that. Um, if you do select a college, uh, sorry, a major in the College of Arts and Humanities, 
um, you will be assigned a CASA advisor. Um, that advisor will stay with you throughout your four years at UCF. And we do hope to help you graduate in four years. Um, you'll also be assigned a major advisor um, within your department of your major. Um, and in terms of um, our expectations, we really just ask that our students be responsive um, when we reach out to you. Um, we have regular advising campaigns. Um, so you will hear from your assigned CASA advisor each semester and they'll ask to meet with you at least once. And so we just ask that you be responsive to those requests and come in and see us so that we can make sure that you're progressing and that your major is meeting your expectations and uh, that you're well on your way. All of our majors in the college have what we call high impact practices. So they're the types of activities that will engage you in research or internships or the types of um, opportunities that will hopefully segue into some career or graduate school opportunities for our students. Um, so really, I just ask that you remember CASA. Um, we will be reaching out to you. We ask that you reach out to us regularly. Um, it's our role to help you um, succeed at UCF. And uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. That is some great advice. I think all of our advising teams across the university and all of the colleges would agree. Be responsive when they ask you to come in and meet. They're here to help you out. So good segue. Let's, um, Mary Rente, how about what's going on in the College of Community Innovation and Education? Well, good afternoon. There's lots of things happening in the College of Community Innovation and Education. Uh, my name is Mary Renti and I'm the director of the Undergraduate Affairs Office for the college that we um, lovingly call CCIE because you don't want to have to go through what I just went through uh, telling you about the name of our college, okay? So um, our college uh, has um, a variety of degrees. Um, we have the education side, which um, teaches uh, elementary education, early childhood, uh, exceptional student education, secondary education, which um, has, as you can imagine, a long list of tracks from English language arts to social sciences, to science, and then tracks in biology, chemistry, physics, um, math, and then what we call teacher education, which is your art education, world languages, and physical education. We also offer a degree in career and technical education. And then, that's not all, then we have criminal justice uh, degree. We also have legal studies, uh, the health, um, the business side of healthcare, which is health informatics and health services administration. And we have three undergrad degrees under the School of Public Administration. We teach in two different campuses. So all the education programs and criminal justice their courses are taught in the main campus. And if you are interested in uh, health services administration, health informatics and information management, um, the School of Public Administration uh, or legal studies, those majors are available in the downtown campus. The exciting news about advising is that doesn't matter which campus you attend, we have advising services in both. So we have an office in the main campus in the education complex in the first floor, room 110. And we have an office in the downtown campus in the Union West building in the second floor. And you can select the site that you wanna go for advising. You don't necessarily have to be assigned to that campus. Uh, to receive advising. So I just want to um, pretty much repeat what Dr. Garcia just said. Please respond to us. 
we are always available and looking out to assist you. So you will have an advisor assigned from our undergrad affairs office. And you will also, when you um, reach the end of your sophomore year, you will also get an advisor from your department and faculty advisors also. So there's an advising team. Beauty of all of our degrees is that you get the opportunity to complete a practicum or an internship. In a lot of the degrees that I just um, listed, actually you don't have an option. It is a requirement, it's mandated for you to graduate. So when you get an email from us or you get a phone call, because we also do phone calls, or you get a text, okay? Please respond. We don't like to be ignored, okay? We want to help you because guess what? In four years, we are the office that will certify your graduation. So stay in touch. Great advice. Thanks so much, Mary. Our final college tonight um, is the Rosen College of Hospitality Management and our representative is Edwina Norvalis. Thank you, Janice. Thank you all for uh, attending this advising uh, panel session A. Um, tough act to follow with all of this great advice from all these different colleges. Um, so a little bit about Rosen College. Uh, we are um, the School of College of Hospitality Management and we are, I will, I have to brag a little bit, we are ranked among the top five hospitality schools um, in the world. So if you choose Rosen, great choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our degree programs range from hospitality management, event management, entertainment management, senior living management and uh, restaurant and food service management um, as well. Uh, we currently do have, um, at the moment, four undergraduate certificate programs. We have a certificate in information technology, uh, theme park and attraction management, professional tennis management, and managing the sporting events. Um, however, coming in this uh, new uh, catalog year, which has been long awaited and seems to be very popular for our current students, we will be offering an undergraduate certificate in beverage management um, as well. Um, so with Rosen College, we, uh, I would say our main campus is located in what we like to say in the heart of the largest learning laboratory. So we are down the street from SeaWorld, also down the street from the uh, convention center. Disney is not too far away, same thing as Universal. We have all of those attractions and restaurants on uh, International Drive, um, but we also have an advising office on the main campus. So um, if you are on main campus and when you would like advising on there, we do have an office uh, that can assist you there. Um, a little bit about Rosen campus, but we do try to provide, because we understand that it is a bit of a distance from the main campus. So we do try to provide as many resources as possible um, for you as well, such as um, an office for housing. We generally will have a representative from financial aid that will come in during peak times uh, on the Rosen campus, as well as a representative from um, student accessibility services to help out with any testing accommodations that um, you might need. Um, we'll also have a bookstore there as well and uh, uh, the library that is also affiliated with the UCF library. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about the Rosen College. Um, in terms of advising you uh, for your first semester as freshmen, you will have an advisor that will reach out to you in terms of a campaign. So like everybody was mentioning, please do not ignore us. <laughs> we will reach out to you. Um, and just try to help you become successful and succeed. And one of the tips that I will mention uh, that we generally like to say a lot uh, at Rosen is to become engaged and involved within the college, within your professors, with your advisors. Uh, there are numerous amount of student organizations that you can be a part of, and it'll just make you that much more marketable come graduation. If you have you know, student A that's going to class, getting good grades, doing internships, um, that's great, but what about those extracurriculars? What is gonna set you apart from the other student, right? So it's doing those other things, doing those volunteer opportunities. Uh, so that'll be my one piece of advice uh, for you guys. So thank you again for joining us.
Great. I think everybody gave some excellent advice. Um, I hope all of the students and parents that have joined us tonight are hearing that we have resources and we have a team of people that are here to help set up your students for academic success. We want you to succeed um, and we want to certify graduation. We want to get you to that degree um, and out into your career field. So um, we've had some great questions in the chat. So we're going to go ahead and get started with that. Um, so our first one for architecture students, where are the classes located? So the uh, architecture program is a two plus two plus two program that's a collaboration between Valencia College, the University of Central Florida, and the University of Florida. And so the intent of the program is to take your first two years of prerequisites at the Valencia campus, and then you would go through the pinup process. And if you're admitted, you'd continue into the UCF portion of the program, which earns a BD, a Bachelor of Design. And then students have the opportunity, once they are in the BD, to either choose to pin up for the UF program, the University of Florida program, at our downtown campus for the Masters in Architecture, or any other program in the nation, frankly. Students can pin up for multiple programs at a time, and in fact, we encourage it. So. Um, that's a very brief overview, but all of the architecture classes are taught at the Valencia West campus. So whether they're taught by Valencia faculty or they're taught by UCF faculty, every architecture course is at Valencia West. And for those of you that don't know, um, we have regional campus locations. So UCF actually has a building and teaches classes at Valencia West, Valencia East, Valencia Osceola, and some of our other campus locations where we have partnerships with our local schools. So there will be other UCF students there, I promise you. Okay, let me get to our next question here. I think we're back to arts and humanities again. Um, in the arts classes, including performing arts, will students outside the major be able to audition for the choirs and or some of the shows? So I'm gonna make a, a bit of a distinction. So it, that applies for theater and for music, but not the arts broadly. So students are um, welcome to audition for all of our theater, performances um, and all of the positions that theater offers um, without being a theater major or minor. A few years ago, the lead and I think our spring show was an electrical engineering major, um, apparently came in and took the world by storm. Um, but, um, and then in terms of music, uh, students are able to audition for all of our ensembles, marching band, any of any of the ensembles that we have that are uh, performance. So you do not have to be a music major or minor for those either. And I see your background is the Marching Knights supporting our UCF football team. So That's right. big That's fan, right. they're, they're a great group um, and very entertaining. Um, so Mary, our next question is for you. How does limited access help informatics and information management program work? Okay. Um, first of all, for that uh, program, you need to have completed all your general education courses as required by UCF and the prerequisites for the program. Once you have that completed, you apply to the program, you need to have at least a minimum overall GPA of a 2.5. Um, the program has entrance uh, twice a year. So they take application in the spring for the upcoming uh, fall. And then they take applications in October and you can start in the spring. So depending which of the terms you're ready for it. Um, they have had um, an excellent pool of applicants, um, but because they can start at two different times in the year, they're able to admit more students in the program. So if there's any concern that, oh my goodness, I, I won't get in, 
I will tell you that anyone who applies now, and if you do have the requirements, then you will gain um, admission. Uh, GPA is, is a big one. That is the minimum, 2.5. And you need to have, like I said, all the general education courses completed and their prerequisites, which if you um, go into our website or you go into the UCF catalog, you're going to see that it's a combination of um, the business side of the house along with uh, sciences. Uh, so it is not a crazy major, okay? This is the major that handles uh, the business side of healthcare when it comes to uh, information, management of it, and protection, including coding and billing. Okay. And just for some clarification, Mary, you mentioned um, some of your programs are downtown. Is that program downtown or at the main campus? No, that program, it is downtown. Thank you. We're very excited about our UCF downtown campus and we have several programs down there. Um, it's really within walking distance to all the great things that a downtown um, city offers. So some of our next questions here, this one's Edwina for you. As a hospitality management major and an incoming freshman, would you recommend you they live on campus at the main campus or the Rosen College apartments? Well, that's going to be up to you um, in terms of what kind of experience uh, that you would want. If um, I will say this, far as uh, the classes is concerned, uh, majority of about your two years would be at the main campus in terms of courses. You'd be taking your gen general education courses as well as um, some of the lower level classes, Rosen classes on main campus. But the further you matriculate into the degree program, the more the courses are only going to be offered on the Rosen campus. But really, you know, what kind of experience you want is going to determine which campus you're gonna live on. If you want that big university campus feel, you can live all four years on the main campus if you want to. Um, but if you want more of a smaller liberal arts, I wanna be immersed in hospitality, then you can do all four years on the Rosen campus. We do have a shuttle that does go back and forth in between the two campuses. So there is transportation that is provided for students and it is free. So you can utilize that or you can drive yourself, but you do have that option. And Edwina, you bring up a good point. UCF has an excellent shuttle system, not only to get you around um, the main campus, but um, if you need to go take classes at the downtown campus, there's a shuttle that runs back and forth to downtown, just like the shuttle that runs from the main campus to Rosen. Um, so take advantage of the shuttles. They've got Wi-Fi. You can um, study. You don't have to pay for gas or tolls. It's a great service that the UCF student government offers to all of our students to get between our campuses. Okay, Cassidy, it's time to get back to the College of Business. Um, when does one apply for their business major? Um, is that gonna be the semester after or prior to satisfying those general education courses? So wonderful question. Um, to give a little bit of background, yes, uh, the College of Business, we are a restricted access college, um, like many of the other colleges have shared. Uh, essentially, that means, of course, you know, you do have to complete uh, a certain set of classes and meet certain GPA requirements before you are admitted. Um, the good thing about restricted access versus limited access is restricted access, um, so long as you meet that minimum criteria, you will be admitted. Um, it is also an automatic process, um, so there's not, you know, a, a formal application that you need to uh, have in place. It, we essentially run um, the admission process at the end of each semester, um, and, and students are notified whether or not they meet those admission requirements. Um, so to give a little background into what those admission requirements are, uh, what I kind of appreciate about um, our, our business uh, restricted programs is that your first Assuming that students do not come in with incoming credit, um, your first two and a half years, two to two and a half years are approximately, uh, are pretty much the same across um, our restricted access business programs. So whether you're a management major, whether you're accounting major, finance, real estate, whatever it is, um, you're gonna essentially take the same set of core classes, okay? Um, so you have the general education program, um, you have our common program prerequisites, which is, you know, for example, macroeconomics, microeconomics, um, financial accounting, managerial accounting, things like that. 
Um, and then slowly you'll move into what we call the business primary core. And the primary core, that's a set of five classes um, that kind of touch on the different avenues of business. So, um, you know, uh, even as an accounting major, you will take a marketing class, you will take a management class, you will take um, a finance class. Um, that's wrapped up in the primary core. Um, so those three sets of classes, plus uh, what we call GEB 3006, that is the first class in the career professionalism series that's mandated for students. Um, though that is uh, essentially our admission requirements. Now, of course, the GPA, it varies based on um, what major you are. Uh, so we can always speak a little bit further um, moving forward. Uh, but so long, once you meet all those admission requirements, uh, you'll be automatically admitted um, into your major. So again, assuming that students do not come in with any incoming credit and must complete the full general education program at the university, um, that puts them at approximately two to two and a half years before being admitted. Um, just to clarify, some students have come in with um, dual and enrollment uh, business AA degrees. Um, and essentially with that, that essentially will satisfy the general education and also actually those common program prerequisites. Uh, normally those, those two economics, the financial, the managerial and all of that, that's normally wrapped up into that business AA degree. Um, so for those specific subset of students, uh, they would be coming in and automatically taking the business primary core. So they would of course be a lot closer being, uh, to being admitted to their major, uh, but things kind of vary depending on what sort of income and credit that you have. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so we've all been living in a virtual world for the last year. Um, but a lot of our students are interested to know about taking online classes. Um, what does the availability look like for online classes? Are you suggesting that for the fall semester? And what can students expect when classes start at UCF this fall? So I kind of let the different colleges, how they've interpreted that. Who'd like to go first? I, I, I can go ahead and take a stab at it. So. Okay. That I think generally university wide we've been advised that the expectation is that beginning this fall we will be back at our typical ratio of online to face to face courses. Um, which I think generally ends up breaking down to around 30% of the course offerings are online so. Um, I think obviously every student and every family has to make their own decisions about what works best. In some cases, um, you'll see that courses are offered in either face-to-face -face or fully online or what we call mixed mode, which is that it's a reduced face-to-face. -face, so it's kind of half online, half face-to-face. -face. But again, like particularly considering for any health concerns or anything like that, um, you, I think the main thing I would tell you is we expect to be somewhat back to normal for fall, but as you come through orientation, if you have any specific concerns or things that we need to keep in mind, I would just encourage you to make sure that you're you make your advisor aware of any constraints or concerns so that we can see. In a lot of instances, um, we, you know, some programs don't have a bunch of flexibility, but some do. And so sometimes we can shift things around a bit to, to accommodate as much as possible. You're hearing the same thing we're hearing, so that's good. Did any of the other colleges wanna talk about, are you doing the same thing? I did want to jump in to speak on behalf of the College of Business, um, particularly with our class modality. Um, so for this upcoming summer, I did see a, a question in the chat regarding summer availability and modalities. Um, for the College of Business, we will have uh, remote uh, virtual classes for the summer, but traditionally uh, the College of Business does not offer uh, any fully online classes just because we are an accredited institution. Um, however, um, like Delia was mentioning, uh, we do offer uh, what we call uh, or the real modality. So it's a version of the uh, mixed mode or uh, reduced seating modality that Delia was mentioning. Uh, so for our real classes, what those are going to look like in the fall is uh, there are going to be six in-person uh, sessions that students would attend throughout the entire semester. Uh, and the rest of the um, material is uh, supplemented via online modules uh, and content such like that. So it's almost like a flipped classroom environment. Uh, and that's the traditional modality for our business courses uh, for those admission requirements that I mentioned. So 
uh, you know, like our, our common program prerequisites and our business primary core, they are offered in that very, very unique modality. Um, and it's really to promote a sort of active um, learning environment in the actual classroom. So again, that sort of flipped classroom environment. But I do like to mention that because it is a very unique modality. Um, and when we do talk about face-to-face uh, -face versus online, uh, that is something significant for the college business. Again, we don't offer uh, fully online courses, uh, but our courses will be one of those hybrid models uh, for the first set of classes that you'll be looking at. I think one of the nice things about UCF is the different modalities that classes are taught and you can kind of mix and match. You can have an online class, a face-to-face -face class, a mixed mode class. Every semester it can be a little different and work with your schedule. So you just have to work with your academic advisors and I think all, you should have heard they're all ready to talk to you and help you plan out that schedule. So um, when you get to orientation, you'll start talking about how to register for your upcoming summer and fall courses. So we've got some other questions here. All right, hold on, let me scroll down here. All right, Mary Rente, in terms of becoming a teacher for the elementary and the secondary um, programs, how much field work or inter interactive classes are there? Or is there just student teaching? Um, well, let me address that in two, two different ways. Um, within the curriculum, uh, students who are pursuing uh, an education degree, that is what we call a certification track, which are students that once they graduate, they are um, pretty much ready to go into the classroom, into a traditional classroom, because our program is certified by the Department of Education in Florida. So those uh, students um, starting early in their college career have service learning type of uh, courses, introductory courses to uh, the education discipline. Um, at the same time, the last year of, uh, you know, their, their college career again, um, they will have their um, fall term of the senior year, a part-time uh, practicum and then their last semester before they graduate, they have a full-time uh, practicum slash internship, whichever way you wanna call it, which it means that they will be pretty much the whole day, five days a week in the classroom. Besides that, um, we do uh, use in our um, curriculum in a variety of courses, um, avatars, which actually um, the college um, is the one who created this uh, way of teaching uh, students. And actually, I would tell you that if you go on YouTube, you will find a few of those um, kind of recreation of being in the classroom. You're looking at a huge screen and you have your classroom and your students there and you are teaching a lesson of course your faculty members there to give you support and to uh, give you some feedback but the program is set up so you feel that you're in the classroom and um, that is before you actually then get to go into your uh, senior year into your uh, teaching experience so yes, there are many different ways that we have uh, endorsements also infused in the curriculum because some of our education programs offer um, students when they graduate a reading endorsement and also the ESOL endorsement. Mary, I will say I've seen that um, set up with the screen and the classroom and super impressive way to practice before you actually get in front of students. Um, exactly. A couple so. years ago, we had a competition uh, among the deans uh, and they were given a topic and everybody had to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, technology is a wonderful thing, and you'll find a lot of technology across all of our academic programs at UCF, um, and it's a great way to teach and to practice. Um, so thanks for mentioning that. Um, Edwina, can you talk about the partnerships that Rosen has with Disney and Universal and other big names in the hospitality industry, and how does that incorporate into the academic programs? 
Well, um, yes, we do have those partnerships. Actually, um, if you come to campus, there are various places that are named after them, like the Universal Orlando Library or the Disney Dining Room, the Darden Auditorium, and uh, the Anheuser-Busch Beer and Wine Lab. So uh, we have these partnerships with uh, the, these um, different various part aspects of the industry to help with our students with our internship requirements. Um, so uh, as uh, was mentioned uh, previously with CCIE, uh, internships are required for Rosen as well. So uh, we have these partnerships with, with industry. Disney, for example, a lot of our students do their internships at Disney, at Universal, and those uh, jobs that we say, we, we call them internships, but they really are paid part-time or full-time positions within you know, various aspects of the hospitality industry. And those jobs do satisfy our internship requirements. Um, all of our students are required to do three internships. Whether you want to do all three of them in the same company, for example, as Disney, absolutely that is something that students um, are able to do. Um, but the internships are, are geared to help build your resume and build your experience. So as far as, you know, Working in attractions for internship one is great. Then you can, you know, either move over to restaurant for internship two or merchandising, things of that nature. Um, at, uh, also on top of that, uh, we have career fair that we have separately on the Rosen campus. And this is where we will invite all the different partners within the hospitality industry to come to Rosen campus, specifically uh, twice a year. So generally once in fall and once in spring and students will have their career fair making connections, networking with all of the uh, different um, industry uh, partners that we have and either, you know, get interviews that day or, you know, a couple days after that and get jobs. You know, so um, I, I think I think I answered pretty much. Was there like a part two to that question? That, that, that was great. Thank okay, you. Great. Career fair is one of my favorite days on campus. Um, I think it's great when students get to that point when they start looking at their career and their experience and what they're going to do to build that resume. Um, it's always exciting to see the students in their suits, resumes in hand. Um, and a lot of our alumni come back um, and get to interview our students for jobs once they've gone out into the field and been successful. Um, so arts and humanities, back to you. Um, for theater minors, can some of the general elect courses satisfy the 18 credit hours for a theater minor? Did you say can some of the general electives? The general elective courses and I'm not in the academic advising world so I don't know if that's general education classes. Can they sell maybe? Um, that can might they be, that would be my, yeah that would be my best guess. Um, so um, if that is the question um, Yes, so there, the, the, the core theater class, TAG 2000, um, is a gen ed course for the cultural and historical foundations. Um, also satisfies other state core and uh, general writing requirements. And so I think I can say generally that, um, just to generalize that question a bit, um, once you choose your major or your minor or whatever programs you plan to pursue, you're definitely gonna wanna work backwards because for the most part, all of the gen ed options are really just a list of courses for each requirement. And you're definitely gonna wanna make sure that you're selecting the best courses to um, get as many birds with one stone as you can. And so yet again, another plug for advising um, we, we know all the ways and we know how to economize. So um, every student's path is different and students combine very unique programs and majors and minors and certificates. And so we wanna just optimize so that you're not taking courses that you don't need. Um, and it starts with picking the right ones in gen ed. And I'll echo that I've worked on college campuses for more than 20 years and academic advisors can interpret that catalog and help you strategically pick classes so you're meeting degree requirements and getting to graduate on time. So again, use your academic advisors um, when you get to Rosen. Um, so we'll go back to Mary. In the College of Community Innovation and Education, are there certificates available for students? Do you have any undergraduate certificates? 
We have plenty of them. Um, <laughs> uh, I think sometimes the joke is we invented <laughs> the undergraduate certificate. Um, depending on you know the area that you you know are looking into the discipline, or depending on the career path the student is is planning for, you will find certificates uh, within our college that may go along with your major or to be honest you could be looking at certificates and minors from another college within our institution um you know uh we're very well known because we have a lot of cert undergrad certificates within criminal justice but at the same time we have certificates within legal studies uh the school of public administration and we have a wealth of minors and um so again it depends sometimes you're going to see that an advisor in our office is meeting with a student and when you look into it they were advising them in like a minor in health services administration but they were not our major they may be a business major I'm just gonna put a plug in there, okay? <laughs> or, you know, uh, vice versa, I'm sure. So everybody understands that you can minor or um, complete an undergraduate certificate within your undergrad career, and it doesn't have to be within the same college of your major. And that's why advisors are good, very good actually, to help you sort through that, okay? Definitely. And what's, I'll just throw this out there, what's the difference between a certificate and a minor? I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, uh, uh, first of all, the the good thing, and then I'll, I'll tell you the difference. The good thing about a certificate and a minor is that you complete both of them at the same time you complete your bachelor's degree, okay? Um, the major difference between a minor and a certificate is on credit hours. Okay. Okay. All right. Again, ask about minors and certificates when you go to talk to academic advising at orientation and see what you can add to your bachelor's degree. Um, we've had a lot of questions about internships and I know um, CCIE and Rosen College have talked about that. But let's open that up. Um, where are some of the students interning in the different colleges? What are they doing to get that experience and build their resume? Um, either volunteering or required for classes within degree programs. Well, I can kind of start about um, with internships. At the Rosen College, pretty much you name it, anything that is hospitality related, that is where they are interning. Um, restaurants, I've mentioned the theme parks, the convention center. Um, I've, we've had some students that have interned on cruise ships. We've had like carnival crews coming in recruiting, you know, interns for that as well. So if that is something that you are, you know, thinking about doing, definitely take advantage of that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, within Orlando or within the state of Florida for that matter. Uh, we have students that um, intern in California as well, New York, you know, different uh, various states within the US as well as international. We actually have uh, quite a few international internships um, in Japan. One of actually my favorite ones, it's, um, it's the Japanese Tourism Association where literally you are going there and blogging about the different shrines and temples and you get paid which is really great. So um, yeah, um, one thing I do encourage the students to kind of it kind of ties internships along with um, studying abroad, because I do get this question a lot. And I had to ask one of the internship advisors, because we do offer study abroad opportunities for our students, whether it is for a, a summer semester, or if you want to go for a whole like spring or fall semester overseas. And uh, the question I get a lot from students is, can I intern wherever I'm at doing my study abroad opportunity. And I had to ask that question to one of the internship advisors and they said, absolutely. You just have to communicate. We do have three wonderful internship advisors that have connections 
uh, within our different industry partners, and they'll able to kind of figure things out, trying to see, you know, accommodations, how that would work if you're trying to do something international, but definitely reach out to our three internship advisors and they'll be able to, you know, help you get the internship that you want. Anybody else? Business or arts and humanities? Sorry, Cassidy, I was gonna let you go. So um, the, the, um, we have a number of majors that actually require internships as part of the degree program. So one example of that is theater and it, it mirrors sort of what Edwina just mentioned that our theater students are all over the country. So they, they're not limited to working here locally. We do have students who do some of the similar things um, to Rosen where they're working at theme parks or they're working on cruise ships, but basically um, those internships can be secured with any uh, theater company in the US. Um, we also have a number of internships um, with through the School of Visual Arts and Design. Um, we, since Rosen is on the call, we've actually just developed a new MFA in partnership with Rosen in themed experience which is super interesting uh, for students who might wanna think about graduate study in one of those areas. So um, most of our students in the arts and a lot of students in the humanities even do those. One of the projects that is super neat on the humanities side since I've spent less time on those is we had a, a student group that um, worked with our Cheddar Department, which is our Center for Humanities and Digital Research. And what this group did is they went around to veteran cemeteries where there were unknown soldiers and they did the research with the history department to develop um, the biographies of those uh, soldiers and then worked with Cheddar to make it an interactive experience so that people who visit the cemeteries can log in and listen to an audio tour of the soldiers at those cemeteries. So there's all kinds of interdisciplinary activity happening um, in the College of Arts and Humanities. A lot of it is uh, born out of just individual experiences that and individual research that students do. That's amazing. I learn something interesting every day <laughs> when I talk to y'all about what our students are out there doing. Cassidy, what about the College of Business and internships? Yes, definitely. Um, so the College of Business, we really try um, to actually continue partnerships uh, with different businesses in the greater Orlando community, um, but sometimes even nationwide as well. Um, there, there. I know uh, a few people have mentioned internships while studying abroad. Um, that is a possibility. I know it's a little bit more rare, um, but it is a possibility in the College of Business as well. Um, little, little fun fact, side comment about study abroad. Um, the College of Business actually uh, sends more students abroad um, than all the other colleges combined. Uh, so that's just to show that we have a lot of really, really unique study abroad programs that we really try to promote because when we think about it, business is global. Um, but to, to kind of rein it back into a little bit more of a domestic area on the topic of internships, um, we actually, as I mentioned before, we have uh, our designated career coaches in our college, which is unique to our, our, our specific college. Um, but one of those career coaches is actually what we call an internship um, or sorry, an employer, uh, li our employer liaison. And our employer liaison really, really works um, more on the back end. So uh, the employer liaison doesn't really meet with our students as much uh, because she is working to um, maintain relationships with different employers um, and different companies in the area. Um, so different companies that students previously, you know, interned at or got a job with, things like that. Um, and what's really unique about that is uh, we are, Employer Liaison, she's one of the ones who run uh, Nightline, which is the exclusive job and internship platform uh, for College of Business students. Um, so when, you know, if you're a business student and you're on Nightline, you're looking at um, specific internships geared towards uh, your industry that you want to go into, uh, which is really, really a unique way to sort of, you know, customize your search, if you will. And again, everything that is listed on our Nightline site, it's uh, a, a 
for lack of better phrasing, a legitimate opportunity, meaning, you know, you're not just going to be getting coffee. This is um, a position that our employer liaison has worked with the employers and really made sure to vet that position uh, to make sure that it is uh, applicable uh, to, you know, our students' needs and to our students' growth uh, relevant to their career goals. Um, so uh, we've even had uh, internships with, you know, things like uh, Lockheed Martin, Harrison Corp Engineering. So even more of those like engineering companies, uh, we do still have uh, partnerships with them. Um, the College of Business and the College of Engineering Computer Science has actually partnered with a few things in the past, uh, which we're, we're pretty excited about. But we definitely have um, some wonderful, wonderful internship opportunities and not to mention not just that, but we also have wonderful support resources to help our students connect um, to those to those opportunities. We say in our college that we ultimately want to get you to the one. Um, that's our slogan. That one being we want to get you to that one dream internship, that one dream job, that one, whatever that one thing it is that you want to achieve in undergrad or by the time you graduate, we're here to help you do that. Um, internships is often uh, a, a big one for our students. So we definitely have a lot of uh, support resources there. I will add um, the College of Business, we actually do not require an internship, but we really, really um, encourage our students to seek out internships. Um, and not only that, but we also like to brag about you all when you do have your internships. Um, so not only, even though it's not required, uh, we still wanna know about those internships. You can still earn an internship for credit for our classes. Um, and we really, really try to make, help you all make that experience very meaningful and impactful uh, for your undergraduate career, setting you up to be, you know, like a, a marketable candidate when you go out into the workforce. Thank you so much. Can I say Mary. something? Yes. <laughs> Because uh, with internships, and I know that I mentioned with, um, you know, that our college has um, not only the availability of internships, but that a lot of the programs is mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, even in those programs that the internship is not mandatory, like uh, criminal justice or, or legal studies, they are um, available, highly recommended. And we have a lot of um, internship sites already set up. Um, and because as you can imagine, criminal justice, legal studies, a lot of government related um, internships. So we have, um, actually, if you go to the criminal justice uh, website in our college, they have all the information um, organized by uh, local, state and federal so you can see the different levels in government and different areas. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, downtown campus and why we are so excited to be in the downtown campus. Um, and it is the great opportunity our students in that campus have to not only start building professional relationships early on in their college career, that probably will end up in that internship and a job, a professional job once they graduate. Downtown campus is in the heart of downtown. Um, if you even look at a map in, of downtown Orlando, you're gonna find Orange Avenue. And I love to say that in one end of Orange Avenue, we have Advent Health. And in the other end, we have Orlando Regional. And in between all that, we have local, uh, state and federal government agencies. So you can walk from the classroom to your internship if you would like to uh, be in that area. Interestingly, even though our um, teaching degrees are not taught in the downtown campus, we have the Orange County uh, Education department OCPS that it would take me, my office is in downtown, one of them, I could take three minute walk from our building to that building. And we are by the Paramore community and we have our education side of the house working with the local school. So we have many grants too, they're allocated uh, to that um, area and we are always then looking for students, either volunteers or also there are some paid positions. So lots of opportunities available. 
Mary, I think that's one thing about the downtown campus. It's so close to a lot of things. You can walk in any different direction and you're connected to a variety of academic programs and career fields. Um, that's one of the reasons it was so exciting for it to open a few years ago. So we are about to wrap up this session. Um, I wanna let everybody know that it is being recorded. So if you miss something or wanna go back and review it, it will be on our UCF Undergraduate Admissions YouTube channel for you to view or share with a parent who might not have been able to join you or a student if they're out doing something um, for work or homework this evening. Um, we're sorry that they couldn't make it, but that's why we're making those recordings available. Um, our next ses session is going to be on living on campus at UCF. Um, the academic experience is vital and a huge part of going off to college, but so is where you live and the campus environment that you're in. So um, Sandy with UCF Housing is going to be joining us at 615 in the webinar. I'm going to put that in the chat so you have that link because you'll need to jump into a new link. Um, and if you're interested in some more academic information, we have the Burnett Honors College and the Lead Scholars Academy session that'll be at 715 tonight in the webinar. Um, I will give one last quick 60 seconds for all of our panelists um, to talk about orientation and encourage students to get registered for orientation and what that'll be like for your college. We'll start arts and humanities. I thought you might go back to alpha. Um, <laughs> so I was ready to jump on my 60. So um, a couple of things. So first of all, I wanna say that I think there might have been some questions that we weren't able to get to. So if you have questions about arts and humanities that I can help you with, please email me. And as soon as I stop talking, I will put my information in the chat for you all. Um, my biggest thing I would say prior to orientation, and it's actually a few quick things. Number one, it's okay to not know what you want to major in. And if you don't know what to major in, please choose undeclared. Like if you really, really have no idea, please go on to your student center and change your major to undeclared because that way we will be able to get you with a group of advisors who can start working with you from day one on trying to work out what you want your major to be, okay? Uh, number two, if you do know what you want your major to be or you don't, please bring all of your academic records with you to your Zoom sessions. Um, unfortunately, if you start with us in summer, we often don't have all of your AP scores, IB scores, all of that good stuff. And so we need to rely on your unofficial transcripts in order to make decisions about what's the appropriate level for placement. Um, and um, we look forward to meeting you. Uh, if you come to Arts and Humanities, you'll work with your CASA advisor at orientation. Um, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Okay. College of Business, Cassidy. Yes. So I do want to echo a lot that Delia said. Any academic advisor will definitely echo um, what she said there. I see Mary is also nodding her head there. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, the for us in the College of Business, orientation is one of our first times to connect with you. And we really, really try to uh, connect with our students. We don't look at our students as numbers. We really look at our students as students um, and trying to meet their needs and, you know, push them to succeed in whatever um, we whatever they, they hope to achieve in their undergrad. Um, so with our orientation, please, please, please make sure that you are attending uh, the presentations for um, our College of Business because uh, one, the, main or the main presentation that we will have, we also will lay out our engagement expectations. So just as all of us mentioned before, um, engaging is one of the most important and imperative things that you can do during your undergrad. Um, and we try to take an active role in, in encouraging that engagement for um, our students. Uh, so please, please make sure to attend those uh, presentations. Also, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, college of business or not college of business, advisors, we love talking to you all. We love um, helping you to make your undergraduate experience meaningful and we love having those conversations. Um, so I always say, you know, hey, 
if you have a question, but you don't really know where to go to, come to your advisor. We're that wonderful first point of contact. And the first time that you'll be able to interact with us is orientation. Um, so please do not be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, it, it just prompts um, so much more conversation um, and we love having it. And we just want uh, to help you all make your experience meaningful. All right, thank you. And Mary with CCIE. Well, I hope to be maybe 30 seconds since Cassidy and Delia said it all already, but as usual, I am still going to talk. So anyhow, people, please be prepared for orientation. Take your time to go through the web course. Take notes. When you are reading something and you have a question, write it down so when we have the day of, the online orientation when all the advisors from our office are there available to assist you that we can answer all those questions and Delia mentioned that please bring have with you test course if you have unofficial ones if you did do enrollment please have a list in front of you so you can help us make sure that we provide you the best advice when it comes to your schedule planning. Great. And Edwina with the Rosen College. So again, I echo everything that uh, all of my colleagues um, have mentioned. Um, the one thing that I, I will say uh, that I don't think was mentioned, um, if you need to turn in anything to health services or admissions, those holds <laughs> um, will become a problem come registration. So please, if there is any hold on your account, try to get that taken care of before your orientation day. That will make your life, our life, everybody's life so much easier. Um, again, just a little bit echoing. Unfortunately, we don't get um, updated information at the time. So having your your transcripts, your test scores already there with you will definitely help. And uh, just on top of that, if you think that you've already taken a course, please do not sign up for that class, you know, your first semester. Always ask an advisor, advisor, just like Cassidy mentioned, talk to us. Don't be afraid to ask a question and say, I'm not familiar. I don't think like I took this class, but I don't know if it'll count. Ask us, because then we'll be able to help you figure that out whether or not you need to take that class or not. Um, so yeah, that's my last tidbit of advice. Hope to see you guys at orientation. Okay, thank you so much. It's always a wealth of knowledge when we hear from our academic advisors and their teams from across campus. Um, to everyone who's joined us tonight, your academic success is important to all of us at UCF and you've got great resources. I can't stress that enough. Um, if you have already paid your enrollment deposit and you haven't registered for orientation, go ahead and do so. The earlier you register for orientation, the earlier you get to talk to our academic advisors about your particular class schedule. And then um, if you haven't paid your deposit, you have until May 1st to save your spot at UCF. And once you've paid that deposit, you'll be able to register for orientation. Um, so on that note, thank you for your interest in UCF. Have a good evening. For those of you that are interested in housing, please join me at 615 in the webinar. I put the link in the chat and um, go Knights and charge on. Thanks everybody.